We are delighted to welcome you to this session, Intentionally Developing Faculty to Close the Achievement Gap. We want to welcome you from Global Minded. We're all about creating a capable, diverse talent pipeline to get more first generation to college, underrepresented, uh, all different matter of diversity into the education, economic mobility, uh, employment, and leadership pipeline. So we're delighted to have all of you here joining us today. We know that this time of COVID-19 is really a um, challenging time for everybody and being able to come together with some of the leaders that you're gonna hear from today is a really good way to take care of yourself and to energize and to connect to um, people who can really inspire you and your students. So we're uh, really delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Charity Peak and her team that she's put together. She is the um, Director of Academic Programs at ACUE. She is uh, someone with 20 years of broad-based curriculum design and teaching experience ranging from pre-K to graduate school. She's administered multiple aspects of student success faculty development programs throughout her career, focusing mainly on the first year transition to college and uh, professional military education, PEAK has led outcome-based instructional design, academic resource integration, like library and student support services, and strategic faculty development initiatives for multiple higher education, military, and nonprofit organizations, including US Department of State, NATO, and other global organizations across Africa and the Middle East. As former director of faculty development at the US Air Force Academy, Peek received the Outstanding Academy Educator Award for her work in student success and faculty development. And that is where we had the ability to meet probably, I don't know, four or five years ago. So welcome, uh, Dr. Peek. We're thrilled that you're here with your team and we look forward to the insights you all are bringing to all of us today. Thank you so much, Carol, for this opportunity. Um, I'm so excited to share uh, with this audience and especially share the stories of some of the amazing people that um, we work with every day at AQ. So thanks for that that nice introduction as well. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so that we can get started. Um, we are here to talk about intentionally developing faculty to close achievement gaps. And this is something that we are incredibly passionate about at AQ. And I'm going to be um, working together, sharing these stories with a few of my colleagues. So as she said, I'm Charity Peak, and I am an academic director at the Association of College and University Educators. We seek to improve student success through quality instruction. We believe that faculty are the center of a great student success. And so um, we credential faculty in how to teach and um, many other initiatives, including um, presentations such as this. So today we're gonna talk about how faculty development helps to close equity gaps. So I'm going to let my panelists introduce themselves. So Ray, would you like to introduce yourself? Get us started. Definitely. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us. I'm Ray Keith. I'm the Associate Dean of Instructional Intervention and Support at the Community College of Aurora. And um, our college is located um, right outside of Denver, Colorado. We are an HSI and also a um, HSI, and we also serve 60% of our students are students of color. And so again, our work is really around diversity, equity, inclusion, and we aspire to be the college where everyone succeeds. Nice, welcome. Owen. Hello, uh, good afternoon everybody. I'm Owen Lancaster. I'm, I'm at Cal State Los Angeles Center for Effective Teaching and Learning. I'm an instructional designer there. So my major role is to support faculty, um, basically in every way we can, starting with technology, but going into pedagogy and structure. Cal State LA, if you don't know, is one of the 23 CSUs. So those are the large state colleges in California, the largest state college system in the United States. And we're located in historic Los Angeles. So we're right in the heart of everything. Um, so we're a pretty big campus, we're comprehensive. We serve about 25,000, 28,000 students, sort of depending on the semester. Nice, welcome Owen. Lindsay. Hey everybody, I'm Lindsay Hamilton. I'm the director of the 
the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning at the University of Colorado, Denver. So CU Denver is a public urban research university in the center of Denver. We're actually a dual campus university. Uh, so we have more than 14,000 students at our downtown Denver campus and about 4,000 students in our research and advanced health uh, care programs at CU Anschutz Medical Campus, which is in Aurora. Um, so our student body is pretty diverse. About 60% of our incoming uh, students are students of color and globally about 50% are students of color over all of our students. So uh, we are really seeking to improve student success across the board. Nice. Um, welcome. And Kira. Oh, hello everyone. My name is Kira Jackson. Um, I am a student at Community College of Aurora. Um, I attend the college to pursue a nursing degree. Nice. Welcome, Kira. And actually, we're going to start with Kira today. Um, we invited Kira because uh, students are the primary uh, focus for this presentation, but also all of the work that we do in higher education. And so Kira's going to start us off by just giving a little bit about her perspective. One of the things that she has shared with us is that she believes that faculty are the key to solving retention challenges that students are facing. And so we wanted to just start by having Kira share, what do you think some practices are that faculty and instructors use that impact student success? And what I came up with on some practices that faculty members and instructors use to impact students' success are, I came up with creating classroom norms. The reason why I came up with the classroom norms is because I like this because we can create like our own rules and consequences that we as students must follow as a classroom hold. Um, I also came up with getting to know every student the reason why I said getting to know every student is because that's really important in the classroom setting because you're getting to know like the students that you're dealing with and like the students that you're going to be helping in your classroom. And I came up with collaborating with every other student, um, hearing everyone's voice and opinions like such as classroom participation where everyone's voice is heard and everyone like is stating their opinion on how they feel. Um, I also have practicing writing skills with peer review. The reason why I found practicing writing skills with peer review is because I felt like that was the most important due to like when other people are peer reviewing your work and having their opinion on like what you should fix on your work. I feel like that's very important feedback and it's different feedback from just like your teacher giving you that feedback. It's going to be like every student giving you that feedback as well. And another thing I came up with is receiving feedback. The reason why I came up with receiving feedback is simple efforts in the classroom and instructors communication with students can have strong positive impact on students' ability, ability to persist in the face of difficulty. So I feel like teacher feedback is the most important. Like it helps you change and do like better on how they feel, you know. And another thing I found really helpful is availability of instructors in and out of the classroom. I found that really helpful because say for instance, if we're struggling with something, at least we have that opportunity to meet within their office hours that they're able to meet with us. So I kind of love that the most. And that's what I came up with on the faculty and instructors impact of, of success. Thanks, Kira. I really appreciate all that you shared. And what, what I heard you say is that all of these little things that faculty do make a big difference in whether you can be successful or not. Um, yes, and it helps with and it helps with the retention challenges. And that's why I thought of that. And I thought it was a good idea to mention that because that helps with like students trying to finish. Yeah. Yeah, and Kira, I know you shared that there are a lot of other obstacles besides school that get in the way of school. <laughs> yes, there's a lot of other obstacles that could come in the way 
And that's why like at CCA, my college, Community College of Aurora, that's why at CCA they have like a lot of different resources like that can help you like with counseling, like if you're dealing with like deaf in a family or like just anything going on that can jump in your way and affect like your ability to learn like while you're in college. And that's why I said like some people should be considerate of like using those resources because it can really help you. And like, like I said before, I was one of those students that had a problem before with stuff getting in the way. But now I learned like to not let that stuff get in the way. And I know I have help at Community College of Aurora. Yeah, that's great. And there are a lot of different support services that exist. But one of the things that we know is that students spend about 200 times more time with their faculty member than they do an advisor, a librarian, a first year instructor. A lot of um, the faculty have the greatest impact, influence, and frankly, time with students on campus. So they are usually the frontline support for students when they are encountering obstacles, so. Right, right. And with, like you said, with advising and stuff, they have a lot of other students they have to deal with. So with all the students they have to deal with, they don't have really much time to put in, like to really sit down with you and help you. And that's why most of the time, like with your advisor, you have like those three scheduled meetings that you meet with them throughout the semester, but your faculty member or your teacher or anyone else in the college, like they make that time to meet with you. And they sit and like, make time like to actually talk to you and see what's going on you know even if like you're failing in your class like they make time to say hey why do why do you have this grade like let's make this grade go up or let's bump this grade up and that's what I like about like any other colleges too I know um there's a lot of many colleges out there and I know a lot of colleges do do that and they have like focus on doing that so I kind of love that and I know at CCA they do that a lot that's great. Thanks for um, sharing uh, the student voice and just keeping us centered on what is most important about the work that we do, and that is helping people like you to reach your goals. So thanks, Kira. Um, we are going to move next. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more from Community College of Aurora specifically about how, um, how you all think that differentiating faculty development helps to close student equity gaps. So Ray, um, what's your sense about this? Um, I think again, taking this equity minded approach, recognizing that our instructors and faculty come with different skills and abilities. And so it's really important just as we would support our students by differentiating instruction in the classroom, that we really provide differ differentiated um, support in their development. And so when we think about closing those equity gaps, and Charity, I really appreciate you using that term in this slide. I want to go to um, make sure we had some common understanding about terminology. And so I know we had achievement gap as part of our, our topic today. And so when we think about the achievement gap, that terminology in many ways puts the onus on the student. And so we want to really think about um, how can we begin to have equitable practices where the institution, the instructors, um, policies and practices are really taking the onus and not saying um, our students have an achievement gap because of something that they're doing. Really um, interrogating our, our institutional practices, um, instructional practices to see how do we close those equity gaps by um, implementing equitable practices within the classroom. And so I wanna start with the first definition of quality and equality in education is really about providing the same instruction, opportunity, experience, and resources for all students with a focus on sameness. And this comes from the AAC and U uh, 2015. But when we focus on the sameness, that means an example would be, I'm just going to give everyone a pair of shoes. Um, the shoes might not fit, but I was, um, I was equitable in giving everyone a pair of shoes. And so we want to move away from that approach. Um, that we've used the, this terminology for for years and decades, um, but really focus on how we supporting the individual student needs. And so when we look at equity in um, education, it really provides each individual with instruction, opportunities, experiences, and support that meet their needs. And so instead of giving everyone the same support or the same size shoe, 
you actually give them individualized support. And so if I needed a, a size eight shoe, that's what I got. When we think about instruction in the classroom, how do we get, begin to disrupt those practices that are focused on sameness when some students might need some extra support, some students might need um, a different approach when giving out assignments. Um, and so I really want us to think about that as we're having these conversations, how do we move from um, equality to equity? And then when we think about equity mindedness, um, that really is a demonstration of awareness and willingness to, to address equity issues or even inequitable practices within the institution, our structures, our practices and policies, and certainly in instruction as we talk about developing our faculty and instructors and those folks that are in the classroom. And this comes from the Center for Urban Education at the University of Southern California, <coughs> excuse me, which is led by Dr. Estella Ben-Simone. And so she's really done, um, she's been spear, a spearhead in this work around equity. And so I really want us to think about this approach as we're talking about how do we develop our faculty and our, and our instructors. And so over the next couple of slides, I'll start to um, begin to answer that question for you, Charity. And so what you see here is CCA's journey um, as it relates to equity and faculty development. And I'm not gonna go through all of this, this is a lot of content. Um, I know that this will be available um, after the session. And so again, it's about being intentional, recognizing that faculty development is a journey, um, not necessarily a destination. And so CCA started this journey back in 2013 when we partnered with the uh, Center for Urban Education. It was a one-year partnership where they came out and actually um, administered an equity scorecard in our math department. And from there, we really began to look at our instructional practices. And looking at our data, we disaggregated data by race and gender. And that's something that is still new in higher education. And we really want to um, think about how can we do that and how can we do that with intentionality um, so that we are being able to change our, our instructional practices um, so that they're equitable outcomes for all students. And so from that, um, this really was a catalyst for change at the institution. And so we started looking at our data, looking at gatekeeper courses, developing intentional um, faculty development opportunities. And so from the study with um, the Center for Urban Education, we ended up with equity, our Equity and Instructional Leadership Academy which was initially designed for department chairs and we expanded that out to our full-time faculty and ultimately we're able to expand that to our, our part-time instructors as well. The college was also intentional about hiring a college equity officer to lead our inclusive excellence office and through that department we were able to provide inclusive pedagogy training to our full-time faculty and again opening that up to our part-time folks um, in that second year. Um, over the last three years, we've developed our Department of Instructional Intervention and Support, which I oversee, and that department is really focused on developing our Center for Teaching and Learning, focusing on supporting our instructors and faculty as it relates to teaching and learning, um, providing resources which include an instructional coach, um, looking at how do we scale these trainings as it relates to culturally responsive pedagogy, and really um, access those resources and so we were able to uh, secure a title five grant which is a five-year grant 2.8 million dollars um, looking at again incorporating our instructors um, as many institutions know um, our part-time folks are could be up to 75 percent of the folks in the classroom and so we want to make sure that we're providing these opportunities to them as well and that they feel valued and a part of the institution and so if we go to and then again our partnership with aq began um, two years ago and so if we um, go to the next slide, through our department working with faculty and instructors, and the best thing about this, this is truly a department that's um, led by faculty and instructors. The work that we're doing is really leveraging their expertise. And so we wanna take a holistic approach when we're developing our faculty and instructors. And so when you look at this model, you see a multi-pronged approach to how we're really di differentiating those supports for our, our, our teaching um, staff. And so I won't, I'll go through some of this. Um, as you see, lots of things are happening at one time. Again, this is how we di differentiate. And so we started out with our ELA program. Again, expanding that out, we now have cohorts that 
operate in the summer, um, fall and spring semesters. We, once folks go through the ELA Academy, we also are having those folks come back and actually lead those um, sessions. So there's lots of peer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, these become learning communities for our instructors and faculty. With our inclusive pedagogy trainings, we were very intentional about how do we begin to um, support those folks that have content expertise and really look at teaching and learning practice, practices, pedagogy practices. And so our faculty were required to participate in four workshops throughout an academic year. We had, um, we had two workshops in the fall, two workshops in the, in the spring semesters. Those were four hour trainings with external partners who were expertise in, in the field of inclusive pedagogy. Um, lots of theory, but also how do we move from theory to practice? And how do we help our, uh, our teaching staff become reflective practitioners? And so we've done that over the last four years, and, and now we're at a point that we have to reimagine what does that look like? Uh, when you have your, and, and we have a small um, faculty staff, but again, when you have 60 plus folks in the room entering into that space at different levels, how do we start to begin to meet their needs? And so we did that um, through initiatives that were developed by the Department of Instructional Intervention and Support. And with our instructional support initiative, again, led by faculty and instructors, we began to recognize that we needed to create a tier process where folks could really enter in uh, based on their experience and their expertise and the type of support that they needed. So we developed instructional uh, professional development workshop series with those tiers, entry level, intermediate, um, again, creating space for those folks that have been in this work for, for many years. And so folks are in spaces where they're not feeling like they're learning the same material over and over, or being in spaces where, can you help me get caught up because I don't understand this language or this terminology. Again, with our instructional coaches, we also, can you go back just for a second? Thank you. Uh, with our instructional coaches, uh, we were able to participate in a Lumina grant and the coach was able to work with folks individually, work with departments around teaching and learning. And then our partnership with AQ really provided an opportunity for us to, be, to provide an opportunity to begin to think about effective teaching practices at this entry, entry level point where our folks, again, they're, they're content experts, but not really um, experienced in the teaching and learning practices. And so when folks go through AQ, they have an opportunity to go through these modules to learn some practices, to actually implement those practices, to do some reflection. And through this entire process, we begin to develop from reflective practitioners. And it's, it goes beyond that approach of, yes, I reflect on my practices in the classroom, but don't necessarily do anything. And so we really, um, with this comprehensive approach, this multi-pronged approach, we're really able to provide folks with the support that they need almost at an individual level. And so these are some of the outcomes that we've had from our experience. This is our first cohort with AQ. And I really just want to focus on um, the middle section where it says faculty report modules were helpful in refining their teaching practices. And again, that goes back to how do we develop um, instructors and faculty to become reflexive practitioners? How do we help them understand um, that they can have agency in how they're teaching in the classroom? Many folks teach the way they were taught, and that doesn't always work for our students. And certainly at CCA, when we have 60% of our students are students of color, and as, as we know in higher education, um, that structure benefits some groups over others, and that's why we do have those equity gaps. And so we really want to just again highlight that our folks began to refine their teaching practices, and then we saw positive outcomes with that. Next slide. Uh, the one piece I want to focus on here is beliefs about students and the trans transformative experience that our instructors and faculty had as, again, they were able to go through a well-crafted course that supported their development as a faculty and an instructor. And so what you'll see is our folks learned that um, they played a huge role in making sure that their students became better learners. Again, at the beginning, 82% of our faculty thought that once they completed the course, 100% of our faculty truly understood 
that they have a role in um, how their students are learning. It gave them a response. It, again, it changed their responsibility. It also helped them understand that they had agency. Go back one more, sorry. <laughs> Um, it really helped them understand that they had a responsibility to the students, but also agency in how they were really um, creating curriculum, how they, do, they were delivering that curriculum, and also how their instructional choices impacted student outcomes. And so that's one of the great things about developing your faculty is really that transformative piece of that. And then we'll go to the next slide. Um, the next slide really indicates kind of our, our outcomes um, based on how we differentiated that support for, for our teaching staff. So um, over the last two years, we've developed 46 unique workshops. Um, those were developed and facilitated by our faculty and instructors. And again, I think it's very important that we are leveraging their expertise, that we're creating these peer-to-peer -peer learning communities for your teaching folks. Uh, we have, we had 462 participants. And one thing that we do is also compensate our instructors for participating in these um, professional development opportunities. 75% uh, of our faculty have gone through ELA. And um, as you look at our numbers for AQ, and we've only been partnering with them for two years, we've had 35 instructors complete and 10 faculty complete over the last two years. And what we've what our data has demonstrated is that we're actually shrinking equity gaps. Community College of Aurora is part of a 13 community college system, and we're one of the only colleges that are currently demonstrating that our, we're closing our equity gaps or shrinking our equity gaps through these practices. And the system office is actually conducting a study to look at what are we doing at our institution? How are all these types of things impacting student success, closing those equity gaps, um, and making us really a leader in the system office. Um, and again, how do we then develop opportunities to support our sister colleges in this work? And so to answer the question, I think it's really key that we provide di differentiated opportunities for um, faculty development and, and learning. That's amazing. And you have really developed quite a comprehensive program for faculty to meet them where they are in their own professional development, um, but also just a lot of different opportunities. So I can imagine that the faculty really appreciate having all of those opportunities. Um, and it looks like it's benefiting your students as well. So that's fantastic. One of the things we know about these practices, these evidence-based practices, um, is that they actually do have a higher impact on underrepresented students um, and students who are most in need. Um, and so that is one of the values of using these evidence-based practices. So I know another person who's really interested and offers a comprehensive um, faculty development program is Owen from um, Cal State LA. And they had a really specific initiative about reforming developmental education based on a state initiative. So Owen, I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about your success in how you reform developmental education, specifically related to math at Cal State LA, but also piggyback on this discussion about differentiating, because I know Cal State LA does a lot of differentiation for faculty as well. Absolutely, yeah. So I can, I can talk about our, ooh, excuse me, our successes with uh, math education, math reform first, and then about our sort of buffet of options that have grown out of that. Um, so I really like something that Ray was talking about, that we don't sort of want to hold students accountable to being systemically discriminated against, or as Estella Ben Simone talks about, being minoritized, right? And so uh, at the CSU system, the whole CSU system about two years ago had an executive order come down from our chancellor saying, that's it no more remedial math, no more remedial English, because it is a systemic problem. And so our quote here from one of our vice chancellors, the remediation system represents a deficit model that must be reformed if we really hope to achieve our equity and completion goals. I think it really sums up quite well, you know, it's, it's a system that was specifically holding students back and it, it can't be there anymore. So we've gotten rid of it. Uh, this was in 2018. So we're two years into this sort of model and reform. Uh, a little bit about Cal State LA, just to, to give it the perspective, right? So we're historically in, in East Los Angeles. We're a Hispanic-serving institution as well. 
We're also, uh, again, you can see almost two thirds of our students are Pell eligible, so we're, we're predominantly lower SES. And more importantly, we have about 57% first generation college going students for a comprehensive university. So we tend to be uh, up there in the top numbers of first gen students serving universities out there. So we've got a pretty diverse population. We certainly have a population that has been minoritized or has a lot of hidden curriculum sort of getting in their way of success. And so to suddenly say, okay, we're gonna remove this thing that was used as sort of the systemic band-aid to systemic inequality was a nice topsy-turvy for, uh, I think, faculty and for the university. But we rose to the challenge, right? We, we dove right in and it was a huge collaborative effort from both the math department, the College of Natural and Social Sciences, our center, the first year experience center, the undergraduate studies. I mean, it was, it was a Herculean effort. So we sort of took this approach as sort of four foundational um, goals or pillars that we had to go through. One about curriculum redesign, faculty development, student support services, and administrative support. So this was to make sure everything worked cohesively. And of course, the administrative support was making sure it's a um, reusable and sustainable model that we're in as opposed to things that take a lot of money and then peter out which is the concern that we had so I'll focus on the faculty development one and we were very fortunate to be inaugural partners with AQ so uh, Cal State LA and the Center for Effective Teaching and Learning have been working with AQ since 2015 so we've we've been a resource and we've worked together for a long time and when approached with this problem our center's director realized AQ was the fastest and best way for us to scale a lot of the development we wanted to deliver to faculty. So the math faculty were invited to participate in the AQ course in effective teaching practices. Um, we had two math faculty help us facilitate and coordinate. Um, that was mostly to help with the translation. Um, many of you have probably worked with math, math faculty yourselves or you are yourself a STEM or a math faculty person, you'll know that sometimes the humanities example doesn't always resonate with you when talking about teaching practice. And so to have that math translator there was really, really helpful, and incredibly beneficial, and got a lot of buy-in. So the math department's about 100 faculty strong. This is both tenure line and non-tenure line. 90 plus faculty enrolled, 58 of them participated. So that's at least one to five modules they took. And then 31 ended up taking the full certificate itself, completing the entire thing. So a third of the math department basically became AQ certified in being able to do these teaching practices. And it was a wonderful, wonderful experience to scale. And this is just from the 2018-19 school year. Um, what we saw was really amazing. It helped the faculty have this common language with which to discuss and describe quality learning which was just unprecedented for the math department, as they admitted. They had been talking about and struggling with these teaching challenges. I mean, having dozens upon dozens of sections of remedial math sort of banging their heads against the wall to try and support students. And now someone said, well, what if we describe it like this? What if we frame it like this? And AQ's lessons and AQ's modules and practices really helped a lot of the faculty break this out and say this. Um, even those who didn't participate, right? We had a couple of non-participants, but they all started using terms like the think pair share, right? And that, that to ourselves was a lovely barometer that they, ah, they named the term, they named that evil. And so that helped to really build the sense of community. As one of our um, facilitators and math faculty, Sharona Krinsky described it, right? There's a higher level of engagement between faculty. Instead of us being off in our own worlds, there's a community of engagement that has been completely lacking previous to this. Um, more to her quote, Sharona described being stopped in the halls as she was walking from class to class and people would talk instead about, oh, that problem student so-and-so, man, I tried doing this instead and it worked so well. I got 15, 20 students who never talked to talk in class. And so that just complete reframing of the conversation was just really unparalleled and really speaking to the effectiveness of AQ. So at CETL and at Cal State LA, we, we talk about this in the literature of development and faculty development and learning theory as being part of collective teacher efficacy. So if you haven't had a chance to read John Hattie's work in visible learning, um, it's, it's a continuous study of all the meta studies out there of what's most effective. The most effective thing that Hattie has discovered or, or his team has sort of researched is this idea of collector teacher, collective teacher efficacy. And that is that if everyone has the same positive attitude and the same nomenclature about what good learning and good teaching looks like, you're going to see that happen. It's sort of building a community of it and engagement of it. 
a lot like Ray was describing with his whole team as, as it's taken two years for them to get there. It's taken us two years to see these kinds of growth and it's really impressive. It's very, very powerful to see and to practice. And of course, to show our numbers, this is just from our academic years 16 to 18. Um, in, in 2016, you can see we had a 47% pass rate for our GE math courses. And then after rolling out this development by fall 2018, we'd upped it to 73%. Um, so that in itself was a huge achievement for the CSUs um, and then for Cal State LA because we were leading the charge among the CSUs in changing this policy and changing this approach. Uh, you'll notice our cohort stayed pretty consistent in size across the entire board and um, we do have equity gap uh, percentages per course, but we never did it in a full aggregate because we look at equity gaps a little bit different ways at Cal State LA. So we focused on the Pell equity gap equity gap first. And that's the one we were really proud to see that huge shrinkage to 1%, right? So it went from this four to six to 1% difference, which for us spoke volumes to about the preparedness to our students and how if we take on this challenge of teaching our students where they are, meeting our students where they are, by meeting our faculty where they are, everyone kind of succeeds. And so that to us is our, our huge story to tell. Um, we have our numbers from this past academic year and we've continued the trend. So that's what's really good news for us. Um, the, the next step is sort of fun. I'm gonna tap my colleague, uh, Jeff, to, to join in just a second, because really what's happened is, while I've continued to work with the math department in facilitating AQ and providing AQ inspired um, conversations, we actually had a plan to, to create a peer network where we would go into each other's classes, look at teaching and talk about, okay, I tried out this practice and it just, it, something went funny. What do you think was going on? Um, we had to delay that due to the, the COVID-19 epidemic because we can't visit each other's classrooms right now. But the coolest part was when we initiated that process, we asked everyone, hey, so what still works from you in, in the practices from, from AQ? And right away they named things, oh man, I do the think, pair, share, it's great. Uh, wait time, that's been the, the biggest bread and butter for us in math. We ask a question, we grab our water bottle, we sip, and we wait for them to answer so that they actually answer. And it was really, really wonderful to hear. Um, so what's sort of happened is AQ for our center stands in as one of many entry points into faculty development that, that a instructor can take in. So if it's, uh, you know, they, they need something a little bit more synchronous or asynchronous, they need to be online, they're very busy, or because of where we're situated, a lot of our uh, non tenure line faculty work at multiple universities or colleges around us. So something that's got portable, um, stay in it is where AQ really appeals to them. And then once, once they sort of try the faculty development, uh, they, they're like, oh, I need some more. I need to come and get some more. And so uh, I'm gonna give it a little bit of time to Jeff to talk about one of our programs we've launched in the AQ spirit, and that's our inclusive teaching model. So Jeff, if I can tap you. Jeff. <laughs> Hello? Oh, okay. I think his mic, mic might be up, but I can speak to it for a second. Um, is he there? There uh, he is. This uh, issue with my, my mic there. Yeah, so we have our inclusive teaching program, um, and that was a great kind of um, offshoot of the work that we did with AQ. And I think what it really, AQ really helped us see that, you know, faculty are uh, eager to learn online. Um, and so we developed some of our own in-house programming. That's our inclusive teaching program. And um, so far we've uh, welcomed about, just about over, just under a hundred faculty have gone through that at this point. And that has been a really terrific opportunity for our faculty. We work with our five faculty subject matter experts on, on that. And uh, again, it just kind of shows that faculty have, you know, a, a hunger for learning online and for flexible offerings that aren't always in person. Yeah, that's kind of our, my major takeaway from that programming. That's great. And I think you're right. It is hard for faculty to have development when they are working at all different hours. For our lecturers and adjunct faculty, many of them are traveling to multiple campuses. And so reaching them, um, the faculty who are often most in front of our students, is very, very difficult. So an online asynchronous environment gives them an opportunity to participate in faculty development in ways that they wouldn't be able to if they actually had to attend something on campus. So, um, so that's fantastic. Great. Um, I, love, I love what you all have done. And one of the things that certainly rises um, during these 
discussions is about redesigning courses uh, to meet a broader spectrum of students' needs. And one of the things that is interesting about the AQ course um, is that sometimes it doesn't necessarily have to be a full course redesign or a revamping of an entire curriculum. It actually can be the small changes that have big impact. And so um, I want to use that segue to reach out to Lindsay Hamilton at CU Denver to talk a little bit about what they have done with gateway courses, um, because gateway course um, gateway courses often are a tripping spot for students. They often encounter these big, large um, lecture courses, and they often end up being sort of weeded courses. And so what have you done, um, Lindsay, at CU Denver that's impacted your students? Thank you. Great segue. <laughs> I appreciate that, Charity. So, um, if we, perfect. Um, at CU Denver, we really wanted to focus on what we call influential courses. So um, influential courses, as Charity mentioned, are ones that have major impact on student retention and on declaring and then subsequently completing the major um, in a department. And oftentimes these courses are the ones that lay the foundation for later work, but they're large. They typically have to cover a lot of content. They historically have been known to be not so engaging um, and they have higher than average failure and withdrawal rates for students. Um, so I kind of tend to call them myself the courses everyone loves to hate. These are the ones and they're kind of like the third <laughs> third wire there. You don't want to touch it. You, it it's a nightmare <laughs> to think about trying to do a full redesign of these gateway courses, these influential courses. Making improvements can feel like you're trying to like turn around the Titanic in some way. It's a very large, unwieldy um, beast. And we know that the students in these influential courses come in with uh, diverse levels of knowledge. And we also know there's this equity gap here that the students that tend to struggle the most in these influential courses are the students that are first generation, lower income, or underrepresented minority students. Um, so at CU Denver, we thought it was really imperative to start addressing this in inequity in these influential courses. And we chose to use the AQ course as kind of our way of doing that. So we've been running uh, cohorts of faculty through, um, but about 50 percent of the AQ participants teach those influential courses that we talk about. So we really tried to target them. Um, previously, we had implemented lots of different measures aimed at kind of addressing the issues around in these influential courses. We initially started with kind of full course redesigns, but it was having a very limited approach. Um, we wanted to switch gears a little bit and try the AQ Effective Teaching Practices course. And uh, what Charity mentioned is we found that maybe in a lot of cases, total redesign is not necessary, that these small changes implemented um, in teaching techniques and instruction make a big impact for the students. One of the key things to making all these small changes uh, for our faculty was actually the faculty learning community meetings that we uh, set up alongside the course. So all participants taking the asynchronous online AQ course, we had a um, face to face or uh, virtual face-to-face -face Zoom faculty learning community meetings about once a month. These were cross-disciplinary and we found that faculty really enjoyed the cross-disciplinary talk that came from these and sharing their experiences in trying out the new techniques and the new courses and being able to um, kind of have a sounding board to, to how'd that go for you? You tried out that technique, it went terribly for me or it went fantastic for me, what did you do? <laughs> and uh, having that sort of dialogue with their colleagues. So faculty reported that that was one of the most valuable parts of their experience. Next slide, Charity. thank you. <laughs> so uh, the results are in, our faculty find uh, they're enthusiastic, they're learning and they're improving. That's kind of our tagline here. So internal analysis is showing that about, um, generally speaking, the majority, 94% of the faculty find the courses compelling and relevant. Um, what I wanna highlight here is the number of implemented new practices. Um, so they're implementing dozens of new practices. <laughs> after taking this course. Um, as a faculty development administrator, if you had told me there was a professional development opportunity where I could get faculty to implement even two new practices in their course, I would have been like, where do I sign? <laughs> where do I go? And so the fact that they're implementing um, dozens of new techniques and then furthermore, they're 
planning to implement further techniques. You can see 48 additional practices our faculty are reporting that they want to implement, that they are thinking about trying to figure out the best way to put that into their course. Um, we're really happy to see that the faculty found the AQ course to be relevant to them. Um, faculty have to find it relevant to their day-to-day -day work and applicable unless to be willing to make these changes in their course. Um, they have to have that buy-in, so to speak. So uh, we are very pleased with this, that the, we think the AQ reflective practice uh, helps faculty focus on how they can actually implement and apply these techniques um, in the future too. So that's very exciting for us. And this data is really powerful for us. You can see here changes in faculty confidence around uh, certain learning objectives here before and after the AQ course. So more than doubling in some cases, their confidence. And uh, so not only are they implementing these new techniques, we're seeing this huge increase in faculty confidence in these key concepts and their ability to use the techniques in their classrooms. So confidence is really what separates those who persist from those who give up. And we know from the teaching and learning world that when students have confidence, they'll believe they can eventually be able to achieve if they keep going, they can learn almost anything. And the same is true for our faculty. <laughs> they have to be confident that they can implement these techniques and do it well um, to develop real lasting change. So um, improving faculty confidence, we think directly contributes to student success. You know, nobody wants to start with something they don't believe they're good at. So <laughs> being able to have that confidence and say, yeah, I can change my instruction. I can try this new thing. I can do the think pair share. It's not so scary. <laughs> I can wait longer. I'm going to sip my drink. <laughs> Doing those little things uh, can help improve their teaching techniques. Okay. Uh, these are just a few of the quotes from our faculty reflecting on their success. Um, it's been really eye-opening to go through the modules. I've had some aha moments and I've definitely taken notes on ways to improve my classroom methods. I enjoy learning about teaching and discussing teaching techniques with my colleagues. This is one of my favorite ones. My courses are much better today than they were five years ago and they're better now than they were last spring semester. In fact, I'm now having to deal with changing my course activities to compensate for the fact that my students are now remembering and understanding material much faster than they did in the past when I didn't employ many of the methods presented in this course. And it's been a positive experience for me and my students. I'm glad I'm taking the course. So faculty feedback, just overwhelmingly positive. Um, so now I just want to actually share my own uh, small reflection on the experience. I took the course in one of the first cohorts uh, to go through it. And uh, I teach a core, one of these influential courses. It's a introduction to neuroscience core science course for us. And my DFW rate, so that's the percent of students receiving Ds, Fs, or withdrawing from the course dropped from 20% to 8% in a one year period based on two small implemented changes in the course that I took from the AQ. So I implemented an exam autopsy. So a review after the exam, forcing students to kind of think about how they were studying and what they could do to prepare. And then I also, uh, from the note taking module, I implemented skeletal note taking learning objective worksheets. And those really helped me check in for student understanding, pause, make sure they were understanding this, stay on task for everybody. Um, and the most important thing and really exciting thing I think about this data here is I did not change the rigor of this course at all. I kept the content the same, we covered the exact same amount of material, and my exams were the same. We actually standardized the exams. So students were truly learning more. I was just enhancing student learning by making these tiny little tweaks to my instruction. Um, so that's just thrilling to us all. Um, so CU Denver, we've seen enough change in our courses by AQ faculty, faculty that have completed the AQ modules and the positive faculty input. So we are moving forward with our strategic plan to have every faculty member that teaches one of these influential courses to have the AQ training. Um, now, with uh, COVID-19 or in a post-COVID-19 world, we're actually moving forward with the micro-credentialing options that are new for the AQ course um, in order to reach more faculty <laughs> and kind of this just in time for redesigning all your courses and thinking about how you're going to translate them online. Nice. 
and that was a great segue, Lindsay, because um, I was going to sort of end on this note of COVID-19. It's, it's of course, um, everyone is facing this new challenge. And I'm just wondering, based on um, all of your stories, anybody on the panel, how do you think this COVID-19 challenge is impacting your approach to faculty development? So Lindsay just mentioned that she, um, they are starting to look at doing micro-credentialing as opposed to taking a full one-year course. They're also offering small, shorter versions of the course um, that people can take. So what are some other ways that it has, might have changed your approach to faculty development? So for CCA, we uh, moved into virtual trainings. Um, we're actually conducting trainings this week, and so we have four workshops, again, developed by our faculty instructors, um, recording those um, trainings, making sure that they're going to be available in an online setting for those folks that aren't able to participate. Um, so kind of asynchronous and synchronous. Um, we really, you know, we, our plan was to have folks in a room together. Um, and so with the COVID, we had to move online. And because we're in a place where people need this support immediately, we had to develop these workshops over the last probably four months, four, four weeks. <laughs> Yeah, the quick transition to remote teaching and, and remote faculty development, right? Yeah. I think one of the benefits of having online faculty development is that it's a rare opportunity for, for faculty to be online students. Um, you know, many of them, you know, did residential PhD programs. And so learning to teach online is is um, fundamentally change when they are in the student's position in an unfamiliar online learning environment. We use Canvas at Cal State LA, AQ uses Canvas as well. And so a lot of times we'll get questions from faculty later, like, hey, how did AQ do that? Or, or can I do something similar to that? Um, but yeah, I can't understate how important it is for faculty to be in an online learner's position. It's really helped us with the pivot from, for COVID-19. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And a lot of faculty over the years um, that I have heard have said, well, I don't want to teach online or that doesn't seem like something that would appeal to me. And now, whether they like it or not, we're all moving in that direction. And so I think taking an online course does help people sort of dip their toes in the water. And also it models what should a good online course look like so that when they do actually venture out on their own, they have something in their, in their mind um, that shows what that should look like. Any other um, feedback on this particular question or anything else related to the differentiation, the small changes making big impact from the panel? I think, I think with my opinion on the COVID-19 is just some students, like I said earlier, with like obstacles getting in the way, some students weren't like prepared for it to go online. But I also seen for some of my classes, some students that were able like not to come inside the classroom. I uh, seen that most of those students were like participating more when it went online than like physically like being inside the classroom. So I think with most students, like it did help when it went online. And some students it might have not helped because some students like can't cope with it like being online or making time like for their work but I think it was a good approach. Yeah, and I think you bring up a good point too, Kira, is the impact on students. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion about how we can make sure that everything we do is accessible and equitable um, because not everybody has access. Um, not everybody has a full computer. They're working off their mobile device. Um, they're you know, trying to find data and it's a very, very difficult situation and so, this is a really important discussion more now than ever that we are having in higher education about how we're meeting the needs of every single student that we have. Right. Yeah. Awesome. And maybe we'll give people a little bit of time to think of some questions that they could put in the chat for you all. And while they think about that and put it in the chat, I just want to mention that so much of what um, AQ is doing with faculty this is exactly what Global Minded is doing with first generation of college students to connect them to each other, to set up um, peer to peer structures, mentor to peer structures, and then connect them to role models, mentors, internships, and jobs. So it's a similar idea, um, but really looking at the students. And, you know, again, 
we wish we were seeing all of you in person this year, but a silver lining is we normally can have 100 students in our first gen leadership class. This year we can have a few hundred because it's gonna be virtual. So we've worked with many of the um, Aurora Community College students, many of the students from California. Um, uh, Janet Napolitano was one of our speakers a few years ago, a lot of the CU Denver folks. So um, just wanna put out there that if you wanna get the word out yet to your students, that class starts um, June 5th through 6th and Celeste um, is in charge of academic partnerships and she really works with our um, director of leadership and the people that do those programs. And then all year we do programs with the students so that they can continue their professional development and get ready for those internships and jobs. So it's just okay. my little plug in there for the, the first gen uh, program. I think that I think that's absolutely um, correct. And first gen is is definitely one of the aspects. And no matter who the students are in your room, I guess what I would leave people with is this idea that student success, um, there are a lot of different initiatives that are occurring in colleges and universities across the country. We are doing supplemental instruction and adding tutoring centers, high impact practices, redesigning courses, offering advising, career centers, authentic assessment, doing tons of data analytics. We are going all different directions to try to help students. And yet we have really, for the most part, missed one of the most important components, and that is the faculty member. The faculty spends the most amount of time with our students. They are the frontline support for students. And so we should be making sure that we are impacting them and supporting them so that they can be most successful in helping students be successful. So um, I just wanna leave everybody with that thought about the value of developing faculty in order to improve student success. So I wanted to um, just sort of wrap up and ask, are there any questions um, from anyone or any other follow-up thoughts from the panelists. Take your drink, wait time. And if you all want to write to Charity or any of the members of the panel later, oh, go ahead, jump in. Sorry, I thought somebody had a question there. But, but if you all want to write, I know we've got all the contact information. And we're going to have this posted on to our YouTube channel. And uh, we'd love for you to share all of this with the folks that, that you work with so that there's a, a wider sense of the really critical power that faculty have for students. And to, especially during COVID, really realize that right now, that personal connection and all the resources that um, you all have been able to raise today and, and the evidence-based outcome of all of this. So we appreciate all the ways in which you're closing the equity gap and wanna also um, let you all know we've got some other uh, sessions the rest of this week for higher education. Uh, there's a session tomorrow called um, What if eHarmony and LinkedIn had a baby? So that's gonna be interesting on the workforce side of things. And then um, our Latino leadership in higher education um, group will be um, uh, sharing a panel tomorrow afternoon. And then the folks from Ascendium uh, Education on Friday morning are gonna talk about higher education in the pipeline of um, access from the prison system. Really innovative work that they're um, finally, at the end of the week, Dr. Crystal Rose from Aussie Media will be doing post-pandemic strategies um, in higher education with several of the different um, college presidents who are our people of color. So we really appreciate, um, Charity, all the time that you and, and the panel have put in and uh, welcome the ability to really support your work in the future and um, keep your students in mind and how we can be helpful as a, as a structure for your students and your faculty, um, any of the folks that you all work with. And uh, we're delighted that you all made time for this today, all of you who attended, and uh, look forward to working with you all in the future. So let's give a, a round of applause to this, this group, virtual round of applause. And um, thanks again, we look forward to carrying forward. Go ahead, Charity. It does look like we have a couple of questions. Yeah. Go for it. Okay. 
Um, so one question was, and this is this would be a good um, question for the panelists, but are young faculty more likely to participate in these programs or do you have strategies to recruit more senior faculty? Because I think people have an impression that only new faculty would really gravitate towards this program. So what are your experiences with that? I'll say at CU Denver, we've seen a real mix of uh, the faculty that have been participating. Um, since we were targeting those influential courses, those do tend to be taught by um, younger faculty or newer faculty <laughs> to campus or even lecturers or instructors of sorts. Um, so we were, we're seeing a lot of those, but um, what's been exciting is now we're in our third year of this AQ course uh, modality and we're starting to see word of mouth where they're hearing from their colleagues like what Owen mentioned and having the same vocabulary so now we're starting to see some of the more senior faculty say oh I, th I think I better take this course so I know what everyone's talking about <laughs> so I can be on the same page. Okay um, and then somebody else asked can institutions purchase bulk tuition for the micro courses at a lower cost. And certainly um, we can definitely answer questions um, related to that, but feel free to just reach out to AQ if you have specific questions. I'm happy to chat with you more about, really the ultimate goal has been to ask institutions, what are your goals? And as you can see here by these panelists, they each have individual goals. They are common in their mission, but the demographics of their students um, and their faculty vary. And so we really want to make sure that we are meeting the goals of that, um, that particular group as opposed to having a one size fit all approach. So, um, okay, other questions? Okay. Thank you everybody for participating. I know we're um, Zooming and Zooming and Zooming it seems like. And so I appreciate that people added one more Zoom to their day really. Um, so thank you. And thank you Carol for just doing the great work you do at Global Minded. We're so grateful that there is an organization that's reaching out to support um, all students. So thank you for your effort. Thanks to all of you and uh, looking forward to working with you all in the future. And Celeste and I appreciate everything that you guys did to make a great session. So thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye, Kira. Bye.